Hello, in this video I'm going to summarize the five reasons why the true note is correct and the mean note is incorrect. This is a final summary and condensed conclusion from five videos that form a series of videos on how planetary positions are calculated and with that understanding of how planetary positions are calculated why the true node is the actual correct node. So as astrologers, we run our astrology software and we have this choice of true node or mean node. And there's always this question, which one should I use? Is one of them correct and the other one wrong? Do both of them have some validity? And there's also an argument by some people that we really can't trust either one. Neither one is necessarily true. What I presented in that series of five videos is that the true note is correct, period. It's that simple. And that can sound politically incorrect, like, you know, to emphasize, well, this is right and that's wrong. It sounds, you know, arrogant or, you know, inflexible. But, you know, two plus two equals four. It does not equal five. There's certain situations in life where something's right, and something else is wrong. And I present that in detail in the five videos. In this sixth video, I want to summarize it clear and simple and direct why the true node is the correct node. And really, we do not need all five reasons. We need only the first one. This first reason is enough. We don't need the rest. And the first reason is this. You can look up at the sky and do a little calculation and see where the nodes are. The nodes are not some like mysterious thing. They can be seen, so to speak. I mean, you can't just see it with your eye. You have to use some measurement devices to, to get it precise. And the way we do it is you simply take the position of the moon at two consecutive points in time. So in this image of the sky, I have here moon previous day, and then a day later, let's suppose the moon is over here. We draw a line. It's actually called a great circle. We draw that line through the two positions of the moon and where that line intersects the ecliptic plane, those are the nodes. And if it's going from the northern part of the sky to the southern part, it's the south node or K2 and exactly opposite, 180 degrees opposite is Rahu. And if we calculate the two moon positions extremely close to each other, like about a half a minute of time between them, then this line, or more precisely, this great circle that goes through the moon positions, it will match to the accuracy of our calculations where the true node is. So the true node is the observable node of the moon. End of the story. We validated it. So it's that simple. It is when where the node is. You look up the sky, where's the node? That's where it is. Now there's a lot of, you might say, technical detail about how this is done and all that is explained in the previous videos. But to summarize briefly, we've done the calculations and these were calculations that were never done before. I, uh, you know, I solved the problem using spherical trig trigonometry and I put a feature in the Sirius software where you can run it yourself and it confirms that what we call the true node in astrology is where the node is. Just look up in the sky and that's where it is. Done deal. This makes it clear. Now, point number two is that logically, the true node has to be correct. It has to. Why is it logically necessary that the true node has to be correct? Because the true node is used to calculate the actual position of the moon. So when planetary positions are calculated, they're calculated using something called the orbital elements. There are six orbital elements. One of those elements is the uh, nodes, the, the uh, north node or south node. Usually the north node is used, but either one can be used because they're directly opposite each other. And it is that true node that corresponds with the actual moon. So it's not possible 
that you can have the actual position of the moon determined by a node that's not also true. So, I mean, logically, it has to be correct. So, the bottom line here, literally the bottom line of this slide, therefore, it is not surprising that the observed node, the node that we actually see in the sky when we go up and look, matches the true node. It would have to. So, there's no surprise. So, this all just makes it very, very clear that the true node is the actual node of the moon. We go up and you know look up at the sky, there it is, and logically it would have to be. There are some reasons, which I'm not going to go into here, but I mentioned in those earlier videos, in the series of five videos, uh, for why people decided the osculating node that we call the true node may not be true, and those reasons sound convincing, but when you think about it in in more detail, as I'm explaining here, and when you make the actual observations, then you begin to realize, oh my gosh, the true node really is where the node is. And those first two points are all that's needed to know that the true node really is true. When we say true, we mean like that's the actual position. Like when you put Mercury or Venus or Mars or any object in your chart wheel as an astrologer, that's the we'll call true position. I mean, the word true has different meanings in astronomy, but, but here we're not using the sort of technical meaning for true that's used in astronomy. We just mean like where it really is, which is closer to the word apparent. But let's not fuss over the, the semantics of this. What we're saying, and, uh, and again, some of these terms we're using are not the best terms, all we're saying is that the true node is where the node actually is. That's where it is. Um, just like you put Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter in your charts, that's where they really are. That's where they really are. Given certain assumptions about whether you're using speed of light and refraction of light, etc. But putting that aside, it's we're talking about where these things actually are. Now, a third reason. We don't need a third reason. We only need two reasons. Um, we only need really the first reason, um, but if anybody wants additional reason, there are additional reasons why the true node is really true. Another reason is, does it work in your charts? Well, some people say, yeah, the mean nodes work for me. Others will say, well, the true nodes work for me. It's like that in astrology. Everybody has their own opinion. But we can also use an evidence-based approach where you have no power over what charts you will look at. You have the uh, software, we use the Sirius software to extract out the people who have the most planets conjunct Rahu, and we see what's going on. And Clarissa Dolphin did this research, and she presented it in the Vibrational Astrology Conference in the year 2020, and she found the people who have the most planets conjunct Ra Rahu in different vibrational charts, and it it made sense. She was able to come up with meaningful interpretations that fit our theory. Now you may say, okay, well, I do lots of charts and I get meaningful results using the mean node, but there's a difference. This research that Clarissa did is data-driven. The user has no control over the data. It's an evidence-based approach. Well, maybe you don't like evidence-based approaches and you just your personal experience is enough evidence for you. Okay, well, that's fine. That's kind of a philosophical thing, but all I'm saying is that in modern professions like psychology and medicine, etc., there's now a big evidence-based movement where there are rules for determining what is good evidence, and those rules put a lot of emphasis on being able to get your theories to match actual observations that are not based only on your personal experience, but are um, based on being data-driven, uh, where you don't have uh, what we call selection bias. So anyway, we have strong evidence from experience that this works, and also this research that Clarissa did with vibrational charts, it, it clearly distinguishes between the mean node and the true node, because the difference between the mean node and the true node is much bigger in a vibrational chart than it is in a natal chart. So if you're looking at the eight vibration chart, the difference will be eight times larger. 
So instead of being one or two degrees, it's eight or 16 degrees in an innate vibration chart. So they're clearly different and you get different results. It's a third reason. Maybe this third reason is exciting to you. Maybe you're not impressed by it. Whether you're impressed by it or not is really not important in deciding whether to use the true node or mean node because the first two reasons that I give are sufficient for why we should be using the true node. We meaning all astrologers. Fourth point, uh, keep in mind what the mean node and true node are. The mean node is really an unperturbed moon is a better term for it. It's when we say mean, it sounds like you're taking an average moon, like you've calculated the moon at various times and taken an average position. It ends up giving the same kind of result, but that's not how it's calculated. It's calculated by this first step in these two steps that I have on this slide, applying Kepler's laws of motion. The mean node is the node after you apply Kepler's laws of motion. And the second step of calculating the effect of perturbations is not done with the mean node. Well, the second step of calculating the effect of perturbations is done with everything in astrology. We use it to determine where Mercury, Venus, Mars, where everything is. It really doesn't make, why would I care? It doesn't make any sense. Why would I want to know where something is if, the, if life was different? It, you know, like what would life be like if I live in Alaska, um, but the temperature never got below 70 degrees Fahrenheit or something? Well, that's an interesting conjecture, but it's just not true. It does get below 70 degrees Fahrenheit in Alaska. Um, so it's just not, it's not what's happening. So we need to see where things really are, and that's always done by using perturbations. So the fourth reason why the mean node should not be used is that we don't use a mean position. And let's remember, a better word for mean is unperturbed. We do not use unperturbed positions in astrology. To use it for just one thing and nothing else is extremely inconsistent. It's inconsistent to the point of being you might even say bizarre, like, well, I'm just going to all of a sudden use this make-believe thing. I don't, I don't ever want to see where the unperturbed Venus is. So it's just inconsistent. It's strange. Making things very complicated. Um, it just makes the whole basis of astrology very complicated. Keep it much simpler and just use the actual positions. It's like Occam's razor. So that's a fourth reason. It, Again, maybe this fourth reason is not compelling to you. It's fine. The first two reasons are enough. They're sufficient for why we should use the true node. But these are additional, you might say, considerations for why the true node makes more sense than the mean node. We don't really need them. The, the, even just the first reason alone is enough. Um, and lastly, and this is perhaps even less convincing, but it's interesting. And I thought I would share this because it's interesting, is that one of the arguments against using the true node as something true is that this osculating path is a mathematical abstraction. Like it's not the real physical thing. It's this mathematical abstraction. And it somehow feels weird to people to rely on this mathematical abstraction. Well, guess what? Everything in astronomy is based on a mathematical abstraction. These mathematical abstractions predict where things really are. That's why we use them. So let me see, do I have this on the following slide? No, I don't. So I'll just mention it here. If we look at the law of gravity, the attraction between two things decreases by the square of the distance. It's a mathematical abstraction. Kepler's laws of motion are mathemat mathematical abstractions. In other words, they're formulas where we take certain observations, we put it through this formula, and we get something that ends up predicting actual results. It's a mysterious part of nature that these formulas produce the actual reality. It's true with everything. 
uh, in astronomy. So the fact that we're using an osculating path and that it's a mathematical abstraction is no different than the fact we use Kepler's laws of motion, the way perturbations work, everything is based on some abstract mathematical formula which sometimes produces a kind of geometry and perception that doesn't necessarily intuitively make sense for us. It's not only at the level of uh, subatomic particles and quantum theory where things get weird or at the level of relativity theory, you know, with Einstein's theory of relativity where things are strange and not exactly the way we might think of them. But at every level of observation, there's something going on that may or may not match with what you think is the way things should be. And the way things actually are is that these mathematical formulas do predict actual positions. That's always true. So there's not, fifth point is simply this. There's nothing unusual or different about the fact we're relying on an abstract geometry and formulas for determining where the true node is. That's how everything is done. So those are five reasons. When you think about all five reasons, there's just nothing to get excited about or confused about or stressed out about regarding the true node. It, it predicts where the actual moon is. It's, it matches actual observations. It's just perfectly consistent and clear uh, just as much as anything else that the true node is actually true. Um, so that's it, my friends. I just want to summarize, a, you might say a little bit more, more neatly or in one spot, the, these five basic reasons for why the true node is actually true. I mentioned these things in the first five videos, but I think just a nice conclusion like this in summary uh, kind of brings it all home. And if you ever need to explain or want to review, you've got it all in this one video for why the true node is actually true. To fully appreciate everything I've said and to really fully understand it, then you can watch the first five videos. But this summarizes the reasons why the true node is actually true. Okay, my friends, thank you very much for watching this. God bless. Namaste.